Happy Friday, everyone. John Lorden here with another episode of Brain Scratch. Hope you had a nice week. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, this case is really troubling for me because as we go through it, there are developments that happen where you're literally shaking your head just saying, I can't believe that this happened. It does. And then you get to later developments where you're like, why is this not a case cracked? How come we, we can't put this one in the books and make someone held accountable for this? And quite honestly, that's part of the brain scratch for me. I don't know why we can't um, file charges on this case. But what I do know is that for 11 years, this week it's going to be 11 years ago, a family, the Zimmerman family, has been looking for answers, looking for justice, and they're, it seems like they're really losing hope. So I wanted to pull together this video. We're going to go through the information about this case. We're going to try to raise exposure to it again. And I'm going to ask that if you have any information about the murder of Brittany Zimmerman, you please use the contact details uh, in, the, in the description box below and send that in. And let's try to give this family some peace. Uh, here is a picture of Brittany. And this case takes place in Madison, Wisconsin. Madison is the capital of the U.S. state of Wisconsin. Its estimated population is over 255,000 people, making it the second largest city in Wisconsin by population, right after Milwaukee. Located on an isthmus between Lake Mendota and Lake Monona, Madison is a thriving city with a strong culture that revolves around locavore food offerings. I guess that, that means people that like eating locally a live music scene, and an appreciation of the arts. The city is home to the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And Brittany was a student at UW. Um, I've been to Madison. I went there actually specifically for a concert, uh, and I kind of fell in love with it. It is just a, a beautiful area. Um, I, you really get a strong dose of how the arts are important, uh, really good food places, and uh, really cool venues um, for, for listening to music and stuff like that. So uh, I do expect that I will go back sometime soon, but when I was there, I didn't know anything about this tragedy. Let's learn more about it and go through this together. We're starting at thecityofmadison.com. And this is basically a post that was done by what they call their police uh, newsroom. This is kind of official releases from the police department. Uh, shortly after 1 p.m. on Wednesday, and I believe that would be Wednesday, April 2nd, 2008. Uh, Madison police were called to a residence in the 500 block of West Doty Street to check on a person. Ms. Zimmerman was found dead inside her home. Dane County Coroner John Stanley says a preliminary examination indicates the manner of death was homicide. At this writing, no suspects have been identified, and detectives have been unable to rule out that this may have been a random act. A team of detectives will work the case around the clock with patrol officers aiding in their efforts. Quote, this terrible crime is a tragedy and my thoughts are with the victim's family and friends, said Mayor Dave Siselowitz. I am going to work closely with the Madison Police Department and other law enforcement authorities to provide the resources necessary to bring the perpetrator to justice and address the public safety needs of the community. Uh, especially if... You know, we have them considering the fact that this could be completely random. This might not be um, something where she was targeted or some type of personal attack. This might have been someone literally walked up to the door and did this. And that's it, that's what it looks like from the details. Let's let's continue pressing on here. This is a CNN page, but I had to bring it back through archive.org because it wasn't loading properly. Uh, spring was in the air when college student Zimmerman returned April 2nd from classes at the University of Wisconsin to the off-campus apartment she shared with her fiance, Jordan Gonnering. He was out when she arrived home. He discovered her body when he returned. Zimmerman had been stabbed multiple times in her chest, near her heart. She'd also been beaten and strangled, according to warrants. After interviews with Zimmerman's family, friends, and acquaintances, investigators determined there was no personal motive for the attack. Quote, in fact, we have not been able to determine any motive yet in this case, Despain said. He emphasized that police have no reason to believe Zimmerman was the victim of a serial killer. Other details in the released warrants reveal that Zimmerman was murdered in her bedroom, that her cell phone was found in parts, 
The murder weapon was described as a knife, two to five inches long. Police are not saying whether they have recovered it. DNA was collected from Zimmerman's body, as well as hair, blood samples, footprints, and fingerprints. So far, no match has been made to a suspect. Now, the little hint there about the possibility of this being a serial killer, a lot of the articles that I read on this case kind of lumped it in with some other killings that had happened in this area, but not particularly to a student. So I think that's why they're trying to address that right off the bat. But from what we're hearing here, a uh, pretty significant amount of information. First of all, we've got DNA, which you know nowadays we're always looking for in cases like this. But on top of that, we've got footprints, we've got fingerprints. Seems like there is a lot of good solid evidence here. So why is this case not closed yet? Let's continue learning more. Over at Wisconsin State Journal, this is madison.com. Um, and I pulled this up for one specific reason. First of all, here's a picture of the actual apartment, but also to highlight the point, Brittany Zimmerman's killer broke through a door to get in into her apartment before killing her. So obviously that tells us a few things. That, that tells us this isn't a situation where someone had access, regular access to the building for some reason, like maybe someone like a landlord or a former roommate or a current roommate or her boyfriend or something along those lines. This seems like a stranger actually broke into the place uh, and attacked her. And of course, when you see it like that, then the possibility that this is someone completely unrelated to her life certainly goes up a little bit. And that's what we have in this case. Uh, let's continue over at abcnews.go.com. Joel Despain, a spokesman for the Madison Police Department, uh, told ABC News that authorities are following up on a lot of leads. Zimmerman's slaying is the first involving a University of Wisconsin-Madison student since 1996. So that was over 12 years at that point. In an interview with the Capital Times, Kevin Zimmerman, the student's father, described his daughter as a medical microbiology and immunology major with hopes of attending medical school. His daughter, who was in her junior year, had already accumulated enough credits to graduate in the fall, Zimmerman said. She was also recently engaged to boyfriend Jordan Gonnering, and the couple was planning to marry next year in Hawaii. As a young girl, she was just so kind to everybody. She never had a bad thing to say about anybody, Zimmerman said. She was the brightest girl and the most considerate person. She was one who was always willing to help anybody. Brittany Sue Zimmerman lived with her fiancé in the downstairs apartment of the house where her body was discovered. Gonnering had called police after finding his fiancé's body. Zimmerman's boyfriend was not a suspect in the case. He has been and continues to be very helpful in providing information to the detective team. Um, just to learn a little bit more about her, I found another article here at madison.com. Spirited girl had clear career goals. As a freshman in high school, Brittany Zimmerman already knew she wanted to attend UW-Madison and study to be a physician. At Marshfield High School, she was in the top 10% of her graduating class and completed eight advanced placement classes before graduating in 2005. She also played in the school band, was in the Spanish Club and National Honor Society, and on top of all that, she did volunteer work, including at the American Cancer Society Hope Lodge. Uh, UWM said that she was also on the dean's list for fall of 2005 and spring of 2006. Zimmerman's fiance, student Jordan Gonnering, transferred to UWM to be with her. Uh, among her favorite books were The Chronicles of Narnia, Nickel and Dimed, and Women at War. First on her list of favorite films was The Constant Gardener. So now we're going to get to an article that really highlighted a particular problem with how this case went, not necessarily the, the investigation, but actually kind of a cry for help that happened very early in this case. And this article is responsible for raising a lot of ex exposure and um, really making us look at the 911 center that took this local call. Brittany Zimmerman called 911, but no one came. This is an article from May 1st, 2008 in uh, a local alternative newspaper weekly there called Isthmus. Madison police believe Brittany Zimmerman called 911, but the 911 center failed to send help after erroneously concluding the call was a mistake. 
The 21-year-old UW-Madison student's body with multiple stab wounds to the chest and blunt force trauma to the head was discovered at 1.08 p.m. on April 2nd by Zimmerman's fiance. The scene was such a mess that he initially believed Zimmerman had been shot. The 911 center received a call from Zimmerman before she was killed, did not dispatch police, and then did not immediately or accurately inform the police department about the call after cops found her body. One source says cops might have been better situated to make a quick arrest had mistakes not been made by the 911 center. So from what I understand, cops didn't actually get to the scene until more than 40 minutes after the attack actually happened, but she called 911 during the attack. It's just that didn't prompt any action because the operator thought that it wasn't a valid call. Uh, when her boyfriend got home, he called 911 again, and that's what got the cops to actually come to the home. Over the past two and a half weeks, the 911 center has refused requests for basic information about the calls. This week, Joe Norwick, director of the Dane County 911 center since July, declined further opportunities to comment. In an email, he said that he was basing his refusal on a request from the Madison Police Department to withhold all information pertaining to this matter because release would seriously impair the murder investigation. Well, the reporters for this paper decided that they would confirm that, and Madison police officials vigorously dispute this. They suggested that Norwick is improperly using the department as an excuse not to own up to his agency's mistakes. In the wake of Zimmerman's murder, Madison police have launched a crackdown on so-called transients roaming the city's streets. Some of these individuals, says spokesperson to Spain, are dangerous, released from mental institutions, have violent pasts, are drug users, are convicted of crimes but never served prison time because of mental illness. Police, perhaps hoping to match DNA or fingerprints from the crime scene, rounded up about two dozen transients in the days after Zimmerman's murder. So I'm wondering if because they're focusing on transients in particular, if some things may have been taken from the scene, uh, maybe items of high value, uh, possibly cash maybe that she had on her, maybe her purse was taken. Um, I'm just wondering why they're focusing on that type of person specifically. Uh, they are saying that there was some people that were kind of going around the neighborhood that were begging regularly. In one instance, I believe someone actually just walked into the home of a bunch of other people and started asking them for money. It's pretty interesting to me that they're focusing on transients. I'm just wondering what's motivating that. Let's continue with another article at abcnews.go.com. Students 911 call falls on deaf ears. Brittany Zimmerman called 911 from her cell phone before her April 2nd murder at an off-campus apartment near the University of Wisconsin, but a busy county dispatcher who heard nothing on the line failed to notify police or return the 21-year-old student's call. Joe Norwick confirmed Zimmerman's 911 call and his staff member's lack of follow-up at a press conference Thursday after a bombshell investigative report appeared in the Isthmus uh, weekly newspaper. Jason Shepard, the reporter who broke the story, said, it's disconcerting that they hid the 911 call. The reality is nobody wanted this to come out. So according to the story, dispatcher got the phone call, didn't hear anything, but then also didn't call back. I'm not sure. That doesn't sound quite right, but let's get some more of the details from this article. Uh, a dispatcher answered this call and inquired several times to determine whether an emergency existed on the other end of the phone and received no answer to the inquiries, Norwick said. The dispatcher moved on to another waiting call, which was also a hang-up, according to Norwick. The dispatcher then called the second number back and confirmed the call was not an emergency before moving on to a third 911 call about an unwanted person in a Madison home. The dispatcher who Norwick defended and who has not been disciplined never circled back to return Zimmerman's call. So part of the problem I have with that there is the second call was a hang up and they did call back on that one. So just where's the logic in the first call not being responded to, but the second call was responded to in a different way when it's essentially the same type of call? I don't know. There must have been an assumption, maybe because the second one was um, determined to hang up as opposed to the first one where she thought that 
no one was responding. Maybe she assumed that it was like a pocket dial or something like that. Something's different about this. And obviously the process didn't work the same uh, from one call to the next. Under current policy, if dispatchers answer a 911 call and either don't hear a voice on the other end of the call or are un unable to determine if there's an emergency, the dispatcher calls that number back, Norwick said. Adding, however, that police are only automatically sent if a 911 call comes from a landline, not a cell phone. 115 so-called 911 hang-up calls came through the dispatch center every day. 83 of those were coming from cell phones. So you can see he's trying to put out the numbers to defend why a decision might have been made here. But I don't know how that helps anything when he's literally saying, hey, look, the current policy is if you don't hear anyone, uh, you do call back to verify. Uh, police say the call's recording should have indicated to dispatchers that some type of emergency was taking place. It would be accurate to state that there is evidence contained in the call which should have resulted in a Madison police officer being dispatched. Wait, 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 wait. This just moves everything in a whole different direction. So the story that we're getting from the call center about there being nothing on the line according to what police are saying, is not true. They're reviewing the recording and they're saying there's stuff in there that really should have triggered them that something was happening. Uh, so we're getting conflicting stories here. Police offered no indication of what evidence from the call should have prompted the dispatch. Neither police nor Dane County Dispatch are willing to release the recording, citing the ongoing criminal investigation, of course, which we hear a lot in these cases. Uh, the Isthmus story stirred outrage in Madison where residents remain on edge. Perfectly makes sense to me. Someone, you know, bashed a door down to get in and wound up murdering the student. Since Zimmerman's death, her family has created a scholarship in her name. That's just one of many things they've done to honor her memory. We're going to touch on a lot more of those by the end of this video. The investigation has focused in part on Madison's homeless. Uh, but no one has been named a suspect in the murder. And keep in mind, this is an article from back in, uh, well, they don't have a date, but this is somewhere in late 2008. So December 22nd, 2008, an article from NBC15.com. A number of media outlets sued the Dane County 911 Center for the release of the call from Brittany Zimmerman's cell phone the day she was killed. There's no one in court who has listened to this tape Whoever wants to listen to it again, an attorney for the city of Madison argued in court on Monday. It's interesting because he's once again kind of supporting the fact that there's something on this recording that certainly points. I mean, it sounds like the attack is actually captured on the recording. And now we have the media that's saying, you know, this this could be a public threat. This is something that is certainly newsworthy and could affect the public in a very large way. So that's why they're suing to try to get this tape. Um, is it going to go that way? Let's continue. But attorneys representing the media say the public needs to hear the botched call to 911 from Brittany Zimmerman's cell phone. In a search warrant, police have said the call has obvious signs of a struggle. And investigators could hear a scream when it was replayed. But the dispatcher has said she never heard one during the call. Okay. Do I think someone that is willing to spend their time and energy becoming a dispatcher, it's, it's a very hard job from what I understand. Do I think that they're really going to hear something like that and not respond to it? No, not at all. Do I think there's a possibility of maybe they were overworked, maybe she moved from that call to the next one too quickly, something along those lines, a procedural breakdown? Possibly. I think there's also the possibility of some type of mechanical breakdown. Was there something wrong with her headset at that point? Uh, something along those lines could also be possible. But I really don't believe that the woman that was taking this call at the 911 center uh, ignored something like that. There had to be some reason why she wasn't able to either process it properly or, or hear it completely. An attorney for the city argued the recording is crucial to the investigation. Dane County Judge Richard Neese called officials' response to the mishandled 911 call clumsy. He also said there is a presumption in favor of open government, but determined what is heard in the recordings is of significant value to investigators. 
This is a quote from him. If, as has been demonstrated here, that there is value to solving this murder by keeping the recording secret, I seriously doubt anyone in this state would want them released now. And I think he's making sense. But once again, it's pointing to the fact that there must be some pretty good detail in this recording for him to say that this co- this could possibly be used to help solve this crime as well. An edited version of Jordan Gonnering's 911 call is set for release on January 9th. Um, I kind of personally, I don't know why they would release that call. I don't know if it's meant to try to appease the media in some way. But over here at uh, Journal Sentinel, we can see that it did indeed happen. Edited tape of 911 call released. And that was January 9th, 2009. City officials Friday released a heavily edited recording of a 911 call made by the fiance of a college student who was stabbed to death in her downtown apartment. It took the 911 operator nearly a minute into the five minute call to determine that it was a serious incident and close to three minutes before she offered Jordan Gonnering guidance on how to help University of Wisconsin-Madison student Brittany Zimmerman, 21, who died April 2nd. So as you can tell from the tone of how this is being written, I mean, the media is just focusing on this 911 center and really trying to call him out for not doing a very good job. About one minute of the 911 call was edited out. Gonnering can be heard giving the 911 operator his address and asking for an ambulance. When the operator asked him to describe what happened, Gonnering said, I just came home, the door was busted in, and my girlfriend's been wounded. So despite all the evidence that we've mentioned in this piece so far, You know, we've got fingerprints, we've got blood, we've got shoe prints, we've got DNA. This case does not get solved. Now, some things happen around here. Looks like the family tries to file a wrongful death suit. Then they decide they're not going to do that. But literally, years just start ticking by. And then we have a a, a strange announcement that comes out in February of 2016. So let's jump to another article at madison.com. Family says DNA match found in Brittany Zimmerman homicide case. That should be it, right? Case should be solved. We've got plenty of more turns left in this story. We're confirming that there was a DNA match in our daughter Brittany's homicide investigation. The statement from Kevin and Jean Zimmerman said, We are choosing not to release his name as we understand that the DA's office is not prepared to file charges. Now, I'm kind of shocked, but, you know, uh, especially with the case I've been looking into on Three Men in a Mystery, I'm starting to be much more critical about DNA, not in terms of it being a valid result, but in terms of what part of the story does it fill in. If they find someone's DNA and it's found, you know, on the doorknob of the house, let's say, on the exterior doorknob, well, there's a lot of people that can come up and touch that doorknob. That doesn't necessarily make it the same DNA of the person that entered the house and actually did this. So that's what I'm wondering at this point. For them to say they have a DNA match, for them to have all this evidence that we've mentioned previously, but they're not filing charges... I believe the source of the DNA, where it was located, has to be questionable in some way. Madison Police Chief Mike Koval told the Wisconsin State Journal that the Zimmermans had visited with police on Friday and that he understood their desire to have the case solved. The statement from the Zimmermans said they have known of a DNA match for some time and had hoped that the case would have developed enough that an arrest could have been made by now. But they said help from the public was still needed for that to happen. We are hopeful that someone will come forward with information that will bring the investigation to the point that an arrest can be made and charges be filed, the Zimmermans said in their statement. And here's a quote from Chief Koval. Uh, We are duty bound to arrest and refer charges only at such time as probable cause can be established. The case is not ripe for arrest and referral. In April 2013, Gene Zimmerman told the Wisconsin State Journal that Madison police had confirmed that DNA associated with a July 2008 break-in at the Blue Moon and Grill, 2535 University Avenue, matched DNA from the Brittany Zimmerman homicide scene. But the DNA profile reportedly found at both scenes could not be matched to anyone in a national database, setting up a waiting game for the family and investigators. Jean Zimmerman has said she believes the three people convicted of the Blue Moon break-in had a fourth partner 
without a record that would show up in a database whose identity they won't reveal, but whom they know had killed Brittany Zimmerman three months earlier. So what I believe happened in between April 2013, where they were talking about the fact that they had found another location of the DNA, but they didn't have it tied to a person. I'm pretty sure this guy got arrested and his DNA got entered and then it snapped back to the, these two profiles. Um, can we find out who this person is? Let's continue. Over at NBC15.com from February 16th, 2016, Jean Zimmerman said when she first found out about the DNA match, she thought it was an open and shut case. I think many of us would feel like that. Little did she know months and months would pass with no arrest. On Friday, Jean and her husband, Kevin, met with MPD. Despite this DNA evidence, officers told them they weren't ready to make an arrest. Jean said her fear is that it could be 30 years later and they still wouldn't have enough evidence. Jean also spoke about Jordan Gonnering. She said in a cheerful voice that he is doing great and has taken a job out of state. There is a $40,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of Brittany's murderer. In a powerful closing line of the family's statement, it reads, we are not looking for any type of closure, just justice for Brittany. I think this is a great time to remind you guys, if you have information about this case, use those contact details below. There's a $40,000 reward that is also up for this. But wouldn't it help if we knew who they were talking about? Could that potentially help elicit some tips? We got to keep going. Uh, back to another article from Wisconsin State Journal. A search warrant unsealed on Wednesday confirmed that police got a hit that tentatively matched DNA to a man who was reported to be in the area that day. The apparent DNA match from clothing worn by Brittany Zimmerman to David Call then led police to interview a friend of Call who claimed that Call had confessed to him that he killed Zimmerman, according to the search warrant filed in Dane County Circuit Court. This is the guy that matches the DNA. So if you know this guy, if you know friends of this guy, you might have access to that information. If you have that information, please, please, please call it in for this family. Uh, call 50 was interviewed early on by police. A person later identified as Call had gone door to door asking for money to repair a non-existent tire. According to the search warrant, police received a report from the state crime lab on December 9th, 2014, indicating that a DNA profile taken from the right sleeve of a shirt worn by Zimmerman on April 2nd, 2008, had hit the DNA profile of Call. So this is what I'm talking about, about the source of DNA. Um, the fact that it came from a sleeve is much different than if they had the murder weapon and the DNA came from the murder weapon. What I'm curious about is they did mention that they had blood from the scene. Um, was it only her blood that was found there? Could that be tested to see if that matches potentially um, to Call? I don't know, but something is missing in this, uh, to, at least for prosecutors, for them to press charges here. Police interviewed Call's mother, the search warrant states, and learned that one of Call's close friends was a man named Andrew Scholes. Investigators located Scholes at the Gilmer Federal Correctional Institute in Glenville, West Virginia, where he was serving a 20-month sentence for gun possession by a felon that was issued in U.S. District Court in Madison. During an interview on December 17th, 2014, Scholes told police that he was close to Call, calling him his brother. Scholes said that Call had told him what happened to Zimmerman, but Scholes refused to provide details, saying that he didn't want to provide any more information without getting some kind of deal in exchange. I can tell you that Dave broke down in tears one morning and confessed to me what all happened, if I can remember right, Scholes told police. Hypothetically, he broke down and told me what all happened. Even just in that quote, I'm, I'm getting a very strong sense that this is not a guy that is going to give this information easily. Uh, and even if he did, just from what we're hearing about him here so far, would, could it be used in court? Uh, would the defense try to poke holes in who he is with his criminal charges? I think there'd be a lot of problems in terms of trying to use his information. Um, but if he does have the truth, could that potentially help the investigators with finding other evidence to support this story? 
That's part of the challenge with all this. Detective Sergeant David Miller wrote that Scholes was released from prison in October and that Miller had been contacted by Scholes on December 4th, 2015. In that conversation, Scholes said he was willing to provide information he had regarding call if Miller could meet some conditions. The process of determining whether the conditions could be met was ongoing as of December. Call is currently at Dodge Correctional Institution. He had been living in Madison after serving a two-year prison sentence for his sixth drunken driving offense, but was sent back to prison after he was arrested on March 31st for his seventh offense. At the time, he was still serving the extended supervision portion of his sentence. Interviewed by WKOW-TV in February, Call admitted being at Zimmerman's apartment on April 2nd, 2008, but he said he did not kill her. So outside of the physical evidence, the DNA, we now have a direct comment from him saying he was in her apartment that day. And I think if we put a timeline together, I don't have enough information to make a very tight timeline, but we know she had gone to classes earlier that day and then come home. I'm really surprised they can't firm up the window of opportunity and try to drill it into, well, you said that you were in her apartment that day. Obviously, it wasn't after her murder because there was law enforcement all over it. Had to be before that. And we know that she was in classes from this time to this time. So you had to be there during the actual time of the murder. I'm really surprised that they can't try to approach it just from the logic of what was going on that day um, and his admission that he was in her apartment at some point. But it looks like they can't. There has to be some other piece that's missing here. So... Now, that's about Call. What about his friend? What does his friend need so that he would finally step forward and talk in this case? Presidential pardon may be key to solving Brittany Zimmerman murder case. Andrew J. Scholes, and here's a picture of Andrew, 38, said he wants two felony convictions expunged from his criminal record in exchange for giving Madison police more details about what his friend and former roommate David Call told him. One of the convictions is federal, which requires a presidential pardon. I don't want to play games, but I don't see what choice I have, Scholes said. Zimmerman's mother, Jean Zimmerman, said Scholes asked her in an email he sent to her earlier this year to write to President Obama recommending a pardon for him. He told me in the email that he's a man of honor. I told him to be a man of honor and do the right thing, she said. He has a daughter himself. If what happened to Brittany happened to his daughter, he'd be doing the same thing I'm doing. But he refuses to do it, and I don't understand why not. Skulls, who is known as Mud by his friends, wants a 2010 marijuana possession conviction in Greene County and a 2014 federal conviction for possession of firearms as a felon expunged so he doesn't have to give up his gun collection that was confiscated by police. Um, yeah, basically he had a gun collection of 19 guns and because of the drug charge that made him a felon, he's not supposed to have weapons in that case. So his 19 guns were taken away and that's what he wants back to give this information to this extremely hurt family so that they can seek justice. It's a matter of principle. He said, why would I help a government that has completely screwed me? I don't think helping the government and getting nothing in return is doing what is right. It's certainly not what is right for me. Now, even in that statement, what's he talking about helping the government? How does this help the government? I guess because he thinks that it's the police that are trying to close this case. No, this is about helping the family. This isn't necessarily about helping the government. It's just, it, it's terrible when you look into these cases and we already look at the humanity of what has happened. We have someone that has lost their life. We start questioning that humanity when we find out this is likely the person that could have taken it. But I got to question the humanity even more when there's another person that knows information about that person that took the first person's life and they have to have something in return to pass that along. Really, really challenging. And it just, it, it hits me in a really hard spot. And I can't imagine what this family must feel about this guy. But what happens? About a year after that news story comes this news story. A man who wanted a presidential pardon before he gave police any information in the 2008 murder of Brittany Zimmerman has died 
from injuries sustained in a motorcycle crash, authorities reported. Skulls crashed in Fitchburg on July 20th and had been hospitalized since then. The single vehicle motorcycle crash happened in the afternoon. Police said Skulls was at a high rate of speed when the motorcycle went out of control, hit a curb, and continued moving down the terrace, hitting several trees and posts before Skulls was thrown from the motorcycle. It's terrible. Um, it's terrible because you had this family that was hoping there was a chance that maybe maybe his humanity would kick in. And then here we get a year later and there is absolutely no chance that his information is going to help this case at this point. It's already such a messed up situation. But now we learn that there's someone that had potential information that could have helped the investigation or at least helped this family get a better understanding of what happened. And now he's dead. Continuing with an article at channel3000.com, Jean Zimmerman said she was stunned to learn of Skulls' death. I truly, honestly believe he knew everything, Zimmerman said. I was in complete disbelief, actually. I really wish he would have come forward and told us what he knew. Koval said the Zimmerman case still has active leads and the case is being reviewed by a new detective within the office. We are still committed to finding Brittany's killer or killers, Koval said. At this juncture, the Skulls chapter is no longer tenable given his death. So at the 10 year anniversary, Isthmus writes another article. They're trying to determine what did Skulls actually know. And they point out something interesting that in late 2017, he actually changed the conditions of him uh, willing to speak about this case. And he didn't need the presidential pardon anymore. But essentially his lawyer and the lawyers in the prosecution just couldn't make it work. Um, in this article, you do learn that his attorney did send either an email or a letter to the prosecution, essentially saying what he would admit to or what he was willing to tell them uh, in exchange for some relatively simple things. He wanted to be sure that they couldn't charge him for obstruction and a couple of other small things, but not really serious things. But it just seems like the prosecution just was not interested in his information. I think because of that point that I discussed earlier that how do you put this guy on a stand? How, how do you use his information in a meaningful way if you are taking this to trial? Um, it, it's just, it's a really tough situation because the credibility of him as a witness, pretty easy to shoot down, uh, even without all the nonsense of him asking for the presidential pardon, just in terms of his criminal past and all that kind of stuff. I think it'd be really hard to make that information stick. So if he wasn't offering information that could lead them to new evidence, it probably wasn't very useful. And I think that's ultimately what their determination was. So like I mentioned early in this video, we are now at the 11 year mark. I haven't seen recent articles on this case. So I'm looking at articles from about a year ago, the 10 year mark, um, just to get a sense of where the family is at with all this. It remains a source of frustration for both the Madison Police Department and Jean and Kevin Zimmerman, Brittany's parents devastating, just complete sadness for 10 years, said Jean. Frustration, said Kevin. So many times we thought we were so close to solving this, only to be, only to be shot down with, we were wrong, or the DNA wasn't strong enough, or the people we've been chasing for the last so many years aren't really the people we are after. We don't know to this day what really happened. And then this all happened. We were promised in six months we were going to know everything. Madison police have never named a suspect or person of interest in this case, and even now are not confident enough to do so. There's a part of me that is even wondering if they're trusting the DNA. I, like I said, I know that the DNA doesn't lie, so he certainly touched that part of her sleeve, but there must be some aspect where they're not trusting that that's either enough to convict him or maybe he isn't the guy. We know that he was going around the neighborhood asking for money. Is it possible that she was coming up to her front door, he tried to speak to her, and he touched her on the arm, and that's where the DNA came from? I don't know, because we don't really know what type of material transmitted the DNA. It'd be different, I think, if it was maybe his blood that was found on her sleeve or something. But even that, you could have an excuse of, well, I was working on my car tire, and the tire iron slipped, and I cut my hand, and then I touched her. So... But it's interesting because the, the comments from the chief and the police on all this is now starting to slide around quite a bit to where it almost sounds like they're not positive they have their man. 
I don't think we can say that with strength or conviction, said Chief Koval. I think there are supposition, but my suppositions mean little or nothing unless I can prove it. Many have wondered, if there was a DNA match, why weren't any charges filed? Chief Koval says, if we had sufficient confidence in the DNA as evidence in and of itself, probably an arrest would have been made. I would like to think it's more than probably. Detectives have had contact with Call, however, and Chief Colville says, I really couldn't comment in terms of what extent we've had contact. And here is a photo of Chief Colville. Uh, this is not what I would consider to be relegated to a cold case, Colville said. This still has active leads that are worthy. That includes a new resubmission of DNA to the state crime lab, a number of new tips following Scholes' death, and the hope that a death gives the case a new life. I'm still honestly, with Skulls out of the picture, the old school cop in me hopes that loose lips will sink ships, Koval said. Someone is going to say something to somebody about this case in a bar or overheard, and I think someone will seize upon it and give us another lead. Those are the things you cling to. While Koval says his detectives are committed to solving the crime, he understands that the Zimmerman family is frustrated. I understand there will never ever be peace for some of these families, Koval said. We will never be able to turn the page until they can turn the page. That's all we have is hope, Kevin said. We can hope, but realistically, I'm not real sure that they're ever going to solve this, at least not the way it's being handled right now. I just don't believe it. She would be a doctor right now, Kevin said. We would be proud of her and we would go visit her on her animal farm and everything she wanted because she loved animals. That's what we wish that she could have lived her life the way she wanted to. Um, the cold case thing kind of bothers me uh, because I, I hit this with cases all the time where they start getting this old and it's like, how much work could really be done on it at this point? And, you know, the chief is trying to point out, well, we're resubmitting the evidence. We're resubmitting the DNA. We're getting some more analysis. We've got some more tips. Yeah, but... There's something in me that says at some point, let it turn to a cold case. We know that different investigators can pick it up at that point. Sometimes different departments have cold case divisions that can pick it up. It also changes the status of the record. So sometimes family can learn more information about what's actually going on in the crime. In this instance, the Zimmermans actually want to hire a private investigator, but because this is an active case, there's nothing they can do to try to get access to the records to help a private investigator. So... There's, there's still this thing in me. I know I talk about it every now and then on videos. There has to be some mechanism that needs to be figured out and applied on a nationwide scale of you have a case, it's gone 10 years, maybe it meets these other several conditions, that automatically flips it to a cold case. This thing where we let different police departments handle everything differently doesn't help these families. And in a case like this, um, you know they're going to keep this file open because... Look at what happened, even with the limited information that came out and how critical everyone was about the 911 center. Can you imagine if this record actually came out and people looked at it and they said, well, first of all, this DNA result um, doesn't make a whole lot of sense for some reason. Or, wait, they've got everything they, they need here. Why haven't they prosecuted this guy? There's a lot of critique, I guess, that could come their way if that information's public. So there's a part of me that understands that they want to keep it active. Uh, I hope that it's with the intent that they are still truly just mad dogging that case, just working it every single day. But there's a part of me that also wonders, is this just a way to keep that record protected so that people don't find out what's really going on or not going on with this case? And I think that's where the family struggles too. So once again, here is a picture of David Call. If you have some information about this case, about his whereabouts around that time, some any piece of this puzzle, um, maybe you have called it in before, but you feel like it wasn't acted on, please call it back in again. I've got numerous uh, different ways that you can submit it in the contact information down below. But your best bet, particularly if you're interested in potentially trying to get the reward or a piece of the reward, is to call it into Crime Stoppers. That number you can find down below. So are these different organizations learning lessons from this case and evolving? How is the family remembering and honoring 
Brittany's life. Uh, let's jump to an article over at badgerherald.com. Zimmerman legacy lives on. Brittany Zimmerman, first they had a 5K run walk. They did that for a number of years. I don't know if it's still going on because I was looking for information on it. Um, quite honestly, I wouldn't mind. Madison isn't too far from where I'm at. And if I could get down there to help support and be a part of that, I probably would. But from what I'm seeing, I don't know that the 5K run walk is still going on. Uh, the 911 center has made several policy changes. Specifically, the center has implemented a when in doubt dispatch policy. Uh, I've got another article where we're going to go through some more of their changes. Um, UW has worked on several safety related improvements. Brittany's death reaffirmed a commitment to doing whatever we can to keep students safe. That's part of what we want to have as a university value, Associate Dean of Students. Kevin Helmkamp said. The Zimmerman family also held the Brittany Zimmerman Memorial Microchip Clinic to honor their daughter. Her parents, Kevin and Jean Zimmerman, donated money to the Portage County Humane Society for Homeless Animals. So the microchip thing is about microchipping animals, obviously. It also mentions that she had three cats and her fiance uh, actually wound up giving the cats to the family uh, which, of course, they wanted. They wanted something that was that close to her and that could help them remember her. The Zimmerman family also established the Brittany Zimmerman Scholarship Fund. The scholarship is awarded annually to a UW student planning to go into the medical field, specifically from Marshfield, Wisconsin, Zimmerman's hometown. What about the 911 call center? Fast forward to 2018 and they've got all new technology in place. Uh, they have different ways to figure out now if a caller hangs up before the dispatcher actually gets to talk to them. They've got a new phone system, a new computer aided dispatch system, a new radio system. Uh, they also have a 10 digit non-emergency number that is an interactive voice response unit. So you're essentially talking to a machine, but it can give them a bunch of information and that's actually lowering how many calls go into the 911 center. So, you know, reducing any amount of calls to the 911 center is a good idea because then they can focus on the 911 calls. Uh, they're saying that that has lowered uh, the call load by 18% so they could focus on the 911 calls. And they are very proud of the fact that with uh, about 97% of their calls, they are now answering those calls in 15 seconds or less. Despite all the changes at both MPD and the Dane County 911 call center, the Zimmermans have mixed emotions. We're thankful for all the changes at the 911 dispatch center, uh, but they're changes that shouldn't have been made at Brittany's expense, said Jean. I need to get some justice for Brittany, said Kevin. It's all about justice for Brittany. I do think we will find the killer, Jean said with conviction. I just don't think it's going to be the Madison Police Department that figures it out. Really, really tough thing to hear. Um, but, you know, they're looking at this at 10 years at this point, And here we are another year after that. No big developments that we can see uh, in the news um, they talked about, you know, they wish that a TV show like Cold Justice would come out and, you know, try to give this case a, a kick in the pants. I, I think that would be amazing. Um, it seems like a case that should be ready for something like that. It seems like it's on the brink. If unless that DNA result is just completely off the mark, unless it's something really simple, you know, he, he touched her sweater and that's that. Uh, he, it, it, I don't know. But then you've got the confession thing, but can we really trust what that guy was saying? I don't feel strong about that either. Um, I don't know. It's just a mess of a case. I feel terrible for this family and I get why they're critical of the police department. Um, and that's gotta be hard. That's gotta be hard. Can you imagine being the detective on this job or, or one of the detectives on the team that's working this case, just knowing that the family really doesn't have any faith that you're, you're going to pull this off. It's, it's a tough situation on so many fronts. Uh, there was one other thing I wanted to tell you guys about, and that is Pause for Brittany. You can come to pauseforbrittany.com. This is a memorial uh, fun run and dog walk. So if you want to bring your dog and make them part of it, you can do that. And this is still going on. I can see that the next one is taking place in May. 
Uh, so on behalf of myself and my amazing supporters on Patreon and PayPal, we are going to make a donation to Pause for Brittany uh, to help them continue doing what they're doing, honoring her memory and raising exposure to this. Uh, I can see from their media page that basically every year they've been getting a little more and a little more press. And all of that is good for pulling attention back to this case, for raising exposure about Brittany's case. Uh, before I end today's video, I want to thank many new patrons. Thank you guys so much. I kind of put the call out in a video last week that um, YouTube is being very tough on advertising right now uh, for my channel in particular. I still don't know why. You can never get them to be direct with you about what's going on. But many of you are stepping up on the Patreon front, and I really, really appreciate that. Uh, thank you to Tina Lieberher. Thank you to Stacy Lynn. Shannon Hand, Jessica Estock, Ariana, Stephanie Mundy, Ellen Marie, Sylvia Snyder, and Melissa Romandy. Thank you all for becoming new patrons. And on top of that, a big thank you to Sandy M. Reed and Anne, I think it's Coogill, might be Coggill, but thank you both for increasing your pledges. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you helping me make donations to causes like we were just talking about on today's episode. So here's where I turn it over to you, Brain Scratchers. Uh, are they completely off with their investigation? Is this DNA just not valid? Are we looking at the wrong guy? Is there something else going on with this case? Let's talk about it in the comments down below. I ask as usual that we please remain respectful. There's a very good chance that friends or family of Brittany are going to come across this video. And, uh, you know, anything's up for discussion, but I know that there's always a respectful way to talk about cases like this. And I ask that you guys will do your best to do that. Take care. I hope you have a wonderful weekend and I'll see you back here on Monday with a brand new episode of Case Cracked.